Good morning, everyone. My name is Ryan Agassi, and I'm the Teacher Development Manager for Macmillan Education International Curriculum. Today, we have our science author and expert, Debbie Roberts, who will be delivering an active and hands-on session focusing on top tips for teaching maths, literacy and science. If you do have any questions, feel free to write them in the questions box and Debbie and I will try to answer those throughout the session. Otherwise, you can leave questions towards the end of the session and hopefully Debbie will be able to answer a few questions. So I'll pass it over to Debbie for now. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning um, in these really strange and weird times. Um, so we're going to be looking at maths, literacy and science. And um, so, but my main objective for this session overall is to reassure you all that if we're directing this mostly at parents and, and, and carers, and I'm aware that some of you will be teachers, but for the purpose of this, your teaching role really is to support parents and carers who are at home with their children. We put a lot of pressure on ourselves to make sure that our children get the best education that they possibly can. And it is a competitive world that we live in. And the worry is that we're not preparing children for the next stage because they've missed such a huge chunk out of their education. But this is all about reassuring you. Globally, we are all in the same position. Every child across the globe has missed some key education, some part of their school life. So the main focus of this webinar is to reassure you and to provide support that you need to work with your children and for teachers to work with families and carers in such unsettled times. Basic, the basic message is relax. We might never have this opportunity ever again. A few weeks ago, if you'd have been told, stay at home, be with your children, work from home, you would have said, yeah, that's fantastic. Time, don't have to go to work, don't have to go to the supermarket, don't have to visit, don't have to go. We would have, we would have applauded it. Now we're in it because we're being told this is what we have to do. It's difficult, but make the most of it. Relax and take the pressure off. So the key points are, we are all in the same situation. It doesn't matter where you are. Don't try to educate your children. That's not your job. Even if you're a teacher, and I can say this from experience, even if you're a qualified teacher, an experienced teacher, it's very difficult to teach your own children. I've tried, it's really difficult. So you're putting yourself into a position that's near enough impossible. You're probably in a situation where you're working from home. You might be working part time, but you're probably working from home. You're looking after your children. You might be, you're a parent as well. So you're responsible for parental responsibilities. You've got trying to be a teacher and you're working. It's impossible. It is impossible to carry out all three roles successfully. Something will give and it will be you because you're putting yourself into a position that you really, really cannot be successful at. You need to choose one role and do that role responsibly. That role will probably be work. We need to put bread on the table. We need to pay the bills. We need to carry on with our work, with our jobs and look after our children. Don't try to teach the children. Review, reflect, look at what they already know and build on that. Every curriculum I've ever worked on from kindergarten right up to university level has always had some aspect where we're encouraging children making links in their learning to the real world making links into everyday situations. We don't know what their job will be like. We have no perception of future careers. We don't know what they'll be expected to do in their working day. We need to prepare them to be independent, to be problem solvers, to be inquiry-based children, to ask questions, 
and to have the skills to be able to adapt and apply themselves to any situation that they're given. This is an ideal opportunity, an opportunity that teachers probably won't have sufficient time to fulfil, to link to the real world, to link to every day, to, to see what the bigger picture is. So don't worry about what the final destination in your children's education is. Don't worry about what's happening next or the assessments or final assessments or moving to a new key stage. Don't worry about that. That's our job. That's educators' job. Teachers and educators will nurture and support and get them ready for the next stage. That's what we do. Your job is to enjoy being with your children and to make the best of a situation. When we come out of this, the children will probably look back and their recall will be, we spent time with our parents, we spent time at home, we played, we had fun and we enjoyed it. We can't see that now, but believe me, that's what will be the outcome. So let's start looking at our day. It is important, I think, for everyone, especially children in, in difficult times and unusual times, it's important to have some structure, but not like this. I've seen some parents who have put together timetables and they've emailed them to me and they've said, do you think this is a good idea? Am I covering everything that I need to cover? This is ridiculous. If you're not a teacher, you might, well, you might be a teacher, but you're not that child's teacher. And you're not a school. This is a timetable that's been developed through lots of years of experience and practice through a fundamental knowledge of how to organise a school day. This timetable will be the result of several key players. The class teacher, the leader of the subject area, and there are five or six different subject areas on this particular timetable. There'll be some kind of management team put the structure together. This could be the work of 10 different people. You're not 10 people. You're actually probably only a third of a person because you're trying to fulfill all your other roles as well. So let's look at what we really mean by looking at the structure of a day. Something more like this. And the key information there is, if you get a better opportunity, just do it. If on Monday at 9 a.m., you get an opportunity to go outside because there's a nice sunset or a thunderstorm or a particular bird that you can see or something's flowering in the garden or a planter. Do it. Go and look at that. Work to every opportunity. Make the most of it. This is just a backbone to give you a little bit of confidence that there is some structure to your day. So for English, for example, literacy encourage children to write a diary. Everything I've tried to do is not based at a particular age or stage. It's something that you can differentiate because the likelihood is that you will have children of different ages in your care, different ages and different abilities. And this differentiation would be a real challenge for a qualified and experienced teacher. If you're neither of those, You'll find it impossible to differentiate at every level and every subject for a whole day, a whole week, and maybe a month or even longer. So things like writing a diary, any age of a child can do that. Any student can, a younger child might take photographs. They might make drawings. They might make a pictorial diary. Older children might write a very detailed time by time diary every hour of the day or every subject for every day using complex language that's available to their ability in maths look around what what's available can you measure the area of the room can you measure the area of the window what's the volume how much does that cup hold what's the capacity of that bottle in pe Let's, we can do PE. We don't need a big space. We don't need to be outside. So long, so long as you've got some space that say, clear the objects, push the furniture back and do some exercise, get moving. 
we're not talking about a gymnasium we're talking about getting moving getting your pulse rate moving get out of your seat so we're trying to make a structure of a day that fits in to all your other roles in science i've tried to do it by looking at an average day so for example for breakfast you might have eggs in this activity we're using that picture as a stimulus i've also made one just to show that it is possible at home i put it in a container that's not really that good the reason being is i'm quite clumsy and using water next to a laptop would not be a great idea for me um, spill the water on the laptop webinars over but you can see from this that it is doable and it is a stimulus so we've got the egg floating at the top you can just see the top of the egg of the egg above the surface of the water we could say to children are oh, you what do you see okay so you're seeing an egg floating at the top of the water i'll tell you what the equipment that you'll need and it's all kitchen science it's all readily available in your home so you'll need three containers three transparent tall containers could be anything anything you can you can put your hands on a plastic cup or a glass so we'll use three eggs water salt and a spoon for stirring and measuring so younger children might look at this and decide this is something to do with floating older children might say but why is the egg floating why do you think the eggs floating what do you think the investigation will look like what would be your plan for this okay so we're looking at concentration the idea is that you will have three concentrations of salt solution in this one it's a concentrated solution so the egg is being supported by the salt solution then we'd pose the challenge how would you get the egg to be floating halfway up the solution and how would you get another egg to lay at the bottom so you'd have the three solutions with three eggs in different places in the solution we'll dissolve the soul into the water and a question you could ask is does the temperature of the water make any difference to the dissolving yeah of course it does the warmer the water the more the salt will dissolve or the quicker the salt will dissolve how do you know if it's a concentrated or how do you know if it's a saturated solution notice the vocabulary vocabulary you're using if you have children of a different age range there's nothing wrong with using concentrated solution solute solvent the more children are absorbed in language the more they pick language up this is an opportunity to really challenge the vocabulary of all the children in your care so this is a challenge and we expect the children to go away and really think about it with some support they might start to think about fair testing how much is a spoonful of salt is it a flat is it level they might ask you for weighing scales or a balance and measure it out really accurately this would make it a fair test because we'd know the exact amount of salt that was being used so i'm doing it in order of the day you might not have eggs for breakfast but because we have problems shopping and buying things at the moment please don't worry about using the egg it's not a boiled egg it's a fresh egg because of the membrane of the shell water does pass over the semi-permeable membrane semi-permeable meaning some things can pass but not everything can so the water can actually pass through to the other side of the shell but the salt can't the grains the particles are too big to pass into the egg 
So you can use the egg as you would normally after this investigation. It won't be wasted. Now I've called this baking cake for tea. Well, I don't know about you, but I don't have time to bake. And I'm pretty sure you might not bake either. I'm not saying to you, go out, buy the ingredients and bake a cake, whether you want to or not. What I'm saying is, use opportunities. In your day-to-day -day life, you are probably cooking. You will be making something. This activity really is making food, cooking food, preparing food, baking a cake for tea. It's, I've just put that there because we can all associate with that old fashioned expectation, that old fashioned story of making cake for tea. That's the only reason it's called that, but it really, it really links to any form of cooking. So let's look at the opportunities. Generally, we will follow in a plan, we'll follow a method and we'll use the ingredients that we're asked to use. To do that, we'll measure. Let's talk about measuring. So we think about mass and weight. Actually, mass is the amount of matter or the amount of substance that's actually in something. And weight is actually a force. So weight is measured in newtons. If you look at any recipe or you go shopping or you look at the products in your cupboard at home, none of them will be measured in newtons. They will all be incorrectly measured in grams or kilograms. It's a misconception that we've just accepted. We accept that it actually is the wrong unit of measurement. This is one of the biggest misconceptions in science, in maths, in the real world, because weighing scales actually quote the wrong unit. This is an opportunity to discuss that. And there's a journal page that will actually help you to get this right and put it across in a good way. So when we carry on looking at our ingredients, when we're making something, you can talk about the changes. So if we look at the ingredients lined up in their packaging and we consider and describe and discuss what they look like, and then we can start to make them, to actually encourage the physical changes due to mixing the ingredients together. If you're using eggs, drop the egg into the mixture and ask, can you get the egg back? Can you actually separate that egg from the butter, from the flour, from the main ingredients? Correct, the answer would be no. No, the change is now becoming chemical. It's not just a physical change. You can separate some things quite easily by sieving or by simply just picking things out. But once we start to encourage chemical changes, that's no longer possible. The change is actually irreversible. And heat is one of the main things that we use to encourage chemical changes. As you mix in the ingredients, ask, can any bubbles be seen? Can you see any bubbles appearing? As you cook your food, you'll probably be able to smell it cooking. You'll be able to smell it around the room, around the house. Ask, why can you smell this? Why can you smell the food cooking in the kitchen when you're in a completely different room or even outside? And explain that this is because bubbles of gas have been produced. Gas is a fantastic state of matter. And gas is a very, very energetic. They will fill any space that they're put in. So if, you're, if you release a gas into an extremely large sports stadium, you'll be able to smell that gas almost everywhere in that sports stadium. Or if you contain a gas in a small container with a lid, when you release the lid, you'll be able to smell it. Gases will fill the space that they are in. They're very energetic particles and they move around. A gas is often produced as a result of a chemical change. And it's one of the things that we look for to decide if a chemical change has actually occurred in any reaction. 
So encourage students to look at, or children to look at the before, what do the ingredients look like, and the after. Has the colour changed? Yes, it has. It's gone from a creamy, light brown colour to a chocolatey brown colour. This is another sign of chemical change. As I said before, this is just part of day-to-day -day life. We're not baking a cake. We're not cooking food for a science lesson. This is part of day-to-day -day living. This is part of your role as a carer, as a parent, to provide food, to take that opportunity to actually teach the science. Don't make an opportunity to teach the science. Use day-to-day -day activities, such as preparing food. This is another activity that's just for fun. So we've had a busy day, we've had our breakfast, we've had our morning schedule, we've written our diary, we've done some cooking, chemical reactions in science, and now it's time for a treat. So we'll get some soda. And I'll get a bottle of soda just to prove it. <laughs> so this is my bottle of soda. So if ask the children, to look at the bottle of soda, I can see tiny bubbles around my bottle. The picture on the screen of the bottle is really clear. You can see the bubbles, you can see bubbles in the bottle very clearly. Ask, what are the bubbles? What are the bubbles? The bubbles are gases. You can see the gases quite clearly. It's enough for some younger children to recognise that the bubbles are just a gas any gas, a gas that's actually in the soda bottle. For older students, we can challenge them and say, is the gas, what is the gas that's introduced to this soda? And they might say carbon dioxide. Lots of children believe that fizzy pop soda is really bad for your teeth. It is, it's really bad for your teeth. You can prove this when you've done this experiment, pour some of the, or at the beginning, pour some of the soda out and put a piece of chicken bone or animal bone from your cooking into the soda. Or if you've got a marble chip somewhere, a piece of marble uh, where you've been doing some construction work or something, put it in the soda and watch it dissolve. It's not the sugar in the diet soda that destroys your teeth, it's actually the gas. And that gas is carbon dioxide. When carbon dioxide is introduced to the liquid, it becomes acidic. And the acid actually dissolves, literally dissolves your teeth. So ask the children about the gases. Can you see a gas? Yes, you can. In this soda. Can you see a gas around the room? No, you can't. Can you feel the gas? Well, you kind of can feel the gas if you wave your hands around, you can feel it on your skin. You can see the effect of the gas. You can see it blowing a flag, blowing a leaf, blowing litter. You can see the impact of the gas on objects, but you can't see the gas. And that's why it's such a difficult concept for younger children and some older children to understand. This is a great fun activity. So pose the question, we know the ingredients for making food has mass because we've just measured the mass. But does a gas have mass? And most people would say no. Because you can't see it, it doesn't have mass. Because you can't feel it on your head, even though we're surrounded by it, it must not have mass. So the object of this investigation is do gases have mass? And I would say, prove it or lose your soda. And this is how we can prove it. So if we measure using, these are just ordinary classroom or kitchen weighing scales. You can use any, a balance works, any kind, anything that you use at home to measure our ingredients, this will do. Even weighing scales for measuring body mass, you can use them also. 
ask the children to measure the mass of the full bottle of soda before you take off the lid, exactly as you purchased it. I've taken the leaf, the label off because obviously I don't want to advertise anything or to promote anything. I don't want you to think that it's a good idea to use the one that I've got. But look at the label. Ask the children, is there any link between what it says on the label and what it says on the balance? And they might be amazed to see that in this particular small bottle of soda, there are 550 millilitres of fluid. Guess what the measurement is? Any ideas? 550 grams. Some people are amazed that there are one gram to one milliliter. And if you use a much bigger bottle of soda, there's one kilogram to one liter. It'd be a really good activity to prove that. Practice. Find bottles, find containers around the home. Look at the label. What's the capacity? How much is in the container? And measure the mass, make comparisons. Ask students, ask children to make tables, to, to record the results and then compare it. You might be within a gram or two different, but that bit will be either the scale, your scale, or the way that it's been measured at the factory. The gas is settle and it does make a difference. Um, but on the whole, you'll find that it's comparable. So what are we going to do with our bottle of soda? OK, so how can I prove that the gas, the carbon dioxide in this bottle has mass? OK, so there's the instruction. I suggest you go outside or you work over a sink or a tray. But don't sit near your best sofa or don't sit near any furniture and make sure you're not wearing your best clothes. It's really good fun. Add video it on your smartphone if you've got one available because it can be really funny. This is an activity that I like to do with adults when I'm training teachers. It's always good fun. So basically, make sure the lid's on tight or done, and that'd be even more fun. Shake the bottle. Shake the bottle so you can see the bubbles of gas appearing at the top and then very, very carefully just release the gas. I don't know if you can hear that. And then shake it again and repeat and repeat until when you try to release the gas, nothing comes out. And that's when you've got rid of all the carbon dioxide in your bottle. The final thing is when you can't release any more gas, measure the mass. And hey presto, two grams, two grams gone. What has gone? What the gas? Correct. The only thing that's changed is the amount of gas that's left that system. Nothing else. If you have spilt some juice, some soda, just release the top over a tray or a, or a dish or something and pour it back in the bottle. It, that will make it a fair test. That will make sure that you've not lost anything else other than the amount of gas, which is what you want to measure. The difference in your two measurements is gas. It can only be gas. That's the only thing. Does this prove that gases have mass? Yes, it does indeed. It does prove that gas has mass. A really difficult concept, and you've taught it at home in your kitchen. We can carry on further looking through max science at the states of matter and expand that to not just from gases but also looking at solids and liquids. So today we actually used a solid and we dissolved that in a liquid. The salt was dissolved into the liquid water and we've looked at a gas and we've looked at that in the bottle of soda. 
we can now start to model matter. Acting things out in science and in all learning is a really good way to understand, to learn, and to also assess if the person learning really does understand it. So this is just a game where we stand next to each other and stand quite closely. We can encourage siblings or people that are at home to hold hands to show that there's a bond between the, the atoms, between the particles. And that's what a solid looks like. And that explains a lot of the properties of solids. The reason that it's very difficult to squash them or compress them. The reason that you can't pour a solid is because the particles are very ordered, stood in a nice, neat line. And then you can ask them to arrange themselves as a liquid. And in a liquid, there's a little bit more space between the particles and they can move slightly. They can wiggle around on those bonds. And that means that they can be poured or they can flow. A gas, as we've said, we've seen in the bottle, gases are very energetic and they will fill the space. So there's a lot of space between the particles and a gas. Sometimes they do bounce into each other and they knock into each other, but ultimately they fill the space that they're in because of the matter, because of the state of the matter, the particles that are actually in the gas. And then we can invite people to come and eat our food and drink our soda by using a telephone. So the idea of this is a fun, easy way to show how sound travels through vibration. So you'll need two cups for this, and this says paper cups, but sometimes paper cups until recently, when we were more conscious about the amount of plastic, paper cups were quite difficult to get hold of, but you can actually use almost anything. So, uh, Food containers, some savoury snacks and things come in cardboard uh, containers with plastic lids, discard the plastic lid. As long as you can make a hole, a piercing in the base of the container, you can use this to make a paper cup, uh, to use a paper telephone rather. <clears throat> You'll also need uh, quite a large length, a long length, a couple of metres maybe, um, of uh, string. Any quality string will work for this. You puncture a hole in the bottom, you thread the, the thread through or the string through, you tie a nice big knot so that when you pull the string tight, it doesn't pull through the hole in the bottom of the cup or the container. The idea is one person speaks into the cup, the vibrations from the vocal cords travel into the cup where they're actually concentrated, they're packed together, the release through the base of the cup into the string. The vibrations travel along the string, the other person's got the cup to, against their ear, their ear, and as the vibrations enter the cup, the concentrated, the pointed, the kept together into the cup, and the directed straight into the ear, where the eardrum picks up that vibration, and your brain translates that into sound. There are lots of investigations that can be done from this, a lot of differentiation. For example, does the kind of cup make a difference to the sound? Use any containers that you can find. Does the length of the string make any difference? Does 50 centimetres make the sound louder, clearer than using two metres of string? Does the type of string make a difference? If you were to lose, sorry, if you were to use elastic, would that increase the vibration? Or wouldn't it? Would it distort the vibration? Would ribbon or thicker string, thinner string, cotton, would that make any difference at all? These are all investigations. So this one very simple, fun investigation that we've all probably seen before could actually become a whole day or even more of an investigation, all looking at sound and how sound travels through vibrations. Again, Max Science have got a brilliant worksheet that really supports this activity. It allows children to work independently or interdependently, depending on who you're caring for at home. But it helps children to work through the activity and to understand it, and to also help you to understand if they've 
got any misconceptions or misunderstanding because the questions prompt review and reflection and they encourage children to think about what they've actually just done and how it's worked and why it's worked in the way that it has and this is a really great opportunity and sometimes at school it's so busy we sometimes don't get the time to review and reflect on the learning that's just taken place so actually this is an improvement so we've invited people now and we've got imaginary guest because we really in most countries now can't have visitors but we can have imaginary visitors we've got our guests ready to eat our food that we've cooked drink our soda and we've managed to invite them using our paper cup telephone so what are the five senses effect we've got touch smell hearing we've got smell and which one have I missed out? Touch, smell, hear, see. Okay, so can we actually eat our food without seeing it? Well, let's think about the senses that actually help us choose what we eat. So we're stood there deciding what we'd like to eat. Which senses do we use? Sight, we look at the food. Does it look appealing? Do we would we quite like to eat that? Does it look nice? That's the first sense. We might use smell. Does it smell good? Could we smell that food cooking from another room? Did it make us want to eat that? Is it possible to eat and taste our food if we can't smell it? Some people lose their sense of smell and we can ask children to research that and find out what impact that does have on tasting and eating food it does make it very difficult to actually taste the food if you can't smell it if you can't see it it does impact on the experience of eating food ask children to try to eat a meal blindfolded make sure they're sat down first blindfold one one observes one tries it's really really good fun but it does make you and it does offer opportunities to discuss what it would be like to eat a meal an everyday activity if you are not able to see and again the max science worksheet really supports with this um, try to play football you don't have to be outside you can do it inside a nice softball blindfolded obviously think about safety on this one and make sure someone's helping and supporting and guiding but it does make you realize our sportsmen and sports people and blind people carry on through everyday activities what does it feel like? Some people say it's frightening. They're running around, but they can't actually see. Ask children to research how blind people play sports using bells, using sound rather than vision. Use the clicking technique. Find a pen that's got a click mechanism to help the um, writing implement move from the through the bottom of the pen. If you click next to a solid, like a wall, it sounds different to clicking in an open space. Some people use the clicking technique to navigate around busy areas where there are buildings, crossings, busy roads. Try and do that. It's good fun, but it's very educational. So we can use the Max Science Primary Journal. This helps you to reflect and review on learning. It should be completed by children and to differentiate you might need to offer more support for some than others but it is a good way to review reflect point out look out for things that are not properly or clearly understood and just repeat it go over it again until everyone understands it clearly we can link PE to science we can link science to lots of different subjects it lends itself really really well to link to geography, science, humanities, so many different subjects, including, as we all know, maths. This is just a game, it's an activity. So if we explain the rules to start with, so some children, um, it's, it's designed for young children, but older children have a good time doing this as well. It's good fun, it's better than sitting down, trying to pretend that we're at school when we're not. So basically, 
one clap or one beat of the drum could mean to push or to pull or to jump, to twist, to turn, to skip. And, you know, just make sure that you've made up your own rules and it works for the space that you're in. And then have someone who's in charge. So someone's clapping and everyone else has to follow follow the rule, follow the activity. So we're, we're jumping, twisting, spinning, anything that fits into your area, your activity, gets us moving, but it also gets us thinking about the forces, the simple forces that younger children need to understand. It's a game, but it's based on forces. And so now we're going to look at Max Maths. So this is primary from primary home learning and it's designed by our Singapore, Singapore Maths Consultant. What we're trying to do with the objective is to make primary maths accessible so that you can actually access it from home. It's creative and it's a creative way in this instance to make fractions and to work with fractions. There are some step-by-step -step lesson plans which are available to you and it's about making maths fun and enjoyable and engaging. So we're going to start by looking at fractions. It's a great way to learn maths and it's hands-on. So it's it's a good way to engage with your children and enjoy being with them. So in this particular picture, children are holding drawings of halves. So they've got a piece of paper, they've divided it into two and they've made two halves. You could repeat this and make this even more fun by making your own, so you're involved and engaged in the same activity, but make a mistake. Oh, this is half. Mm, no, it's not. I'm sorry, we've done that wrong. So can the children actually recognize how you've done it wrong? Why is it wrong? Is it the wrong shape or is it just not quite accurate and not half of the page? Ask them how they know it's not a half. Ask them to explain why they're telling you that you've got it wrong. Ask them what you can do to change it to make it right. What is, what isn't? You can use this kind of activity with so many different subject areas, but it really lends itself well to maths and fractions. It's just a game to help children engage and to enjoy what they're actually doing. So on the left, or on my left, there's a page that shows examples of different shapes that have been shaded in in different ways. So we're looking at halves for this particular example. So we're asking you to ask your children to find the shapes that are a half. Can they show you what is a half? And can they show you what isn't? And can they explain why they've arrived at that decision? And then we've got the parent-child link from Max, Max Maths. This is a really nice way, again, to work at home. And it's for the end of a chapter, for the learning, for the end of a learning episode. Not as a learning episode, we're not talking about lessons. We're talking about the end of a learning opportunity that you discovered, that you found and highlighted at home with your children. These sections are designed to help teachers and parents to understand how the child actually feels about the learning. Do they feel confident? Are they happy? Do they understand it? Can they identify the objects? Can they identify the fractions, the shapes that have been shaded in? Are they content with it? And if not, ideal opportunities. Why? Discuss it. Talk about it. Talk about the objectives. Discover which ones are more difficult, which ones are not, they're not as happy with as they are others, and find out why. If they're struggling with something, Repeat it. Find a different way to teach the same objective. And the language of maths. The language of maths, of maths and science is very complex. We link language with literacy. But actually, this, the language of maths and science can have a really positive or a negative impact. So, for example, words like numerator denominator. These are very, very technical. As we've progressed in some subjects, the vocabulary has become increasingly um, complicated and technical. So let's simply, let's simplify so that we actually understand, so that we can give a good foundation to build on that complex vocabulary. So we can say things like, the numerator is just a number on the top. 
the denominator is the number on the bottom. And as they become more confident, you transfer that into more technical language. So when we're confident that they know that the number on the top, this is the number on the top, and then we can change that subtly. So, ah, you mean the numerator, until children absorb it without really thinking about it. It's not a conscious decision to absorb that new language. It's been modelled, and so it just becomes adopted. And we can do this in, across so many different kinds of vocabulary. We can use the same technique. Here we've got uh, an idea of reducing fractions using everyday materials. So your, your, your children might be actually making a picture, colouring in, designing a poster or the cover of a book, and they might be using um, instruments such as crayons or things from their uh, stationary cupboard, and they, you can actually remove things. Can they show sub subtraction? Can they actually model it? Can they show the fractions? You've taken half away. You've taken half of my crayons. You've taken a quarter of my equipment. You're using most of the paper, the sharing a page to make a poster, but you're using three quarters of the paper. That leaves me with only a quarter. So use other opportunities to encourage fractions. So we've got lots of maths at home activities, simple things that usually use just a piece of paper. So let's explore some of these. So by just using a piece of paper, you can cut it into a square. Now, do we know how to cut it into a square? We'd like to think so, but actually it can become quite complicated. All that you do is most of the paper we use in everyday life is A4. That's not a square, is it? An easy way to do it, fold it over so that the corners the corners meet at the bottom. The remainder is the bit that we need to get rid of. Cut that off and you'll end up with just a square, with a good square of paper. Okay, so once you've got a square of paper, you can fold it into quarters, you can fold it into eights, you can make it into lots of different shapes to actually show the fractions of the paper, the fractions of the page. So ask the student. Can you make it into four quarters? Can you colour in the quarters? This would be something that a stage two child would probably be expected to do. For stages three to five, you'd ask them, can you make it into quarters? Can you draw the four shapes? Can you colour in the individual quarters? How many equivalent fractions can you make with this statement? A quarter, a quarter is equal to what? A quarter is equal to one quarter of the page. A quarter is equal to two eighths of the page, and so on. And this would be for stage four to six, where they begin to look at equivalent fractions. And all you need for this is paper and a pencil. And this is a great way to teach how to make fractions in different way and also equivalent fractions. So this is a really well differentiated activity for this different age groups of children that you're probably responsible for. The duration of this activity is about 10 to 20 minutes, but obviously you can expand on that by increasing the questions that you ask and challenging the children to make the equivalent fractions using a piece of paper. Tangrams are fantastic resources. You know, I've used these with adults teaching adults and the equivalent with four-year-olds. So in this particular tangram, you've got seven pieces. You've got two large triangles, the green one and the yellow one. You've got two small triangles, the two blue ones. And then you've got another triangle, the sort of orangey colored one in the bottom right, my bottom right. And then you've got a par parallelogram, the nice pinky purpley lilac colored one. What we could do with this is print out the tangram. So there are some resources um, in the resources that are available through Max Primary Science. You can print these out if you print them out onto cards and then cut them out. If you can and you've got time, don't be tempted to cut out the shapes for the children. Get them to cut them out for themselves. For younger children, this is a great way to promote 
the skill of fine motor skills. So actually using the scissors to cut out the lines is actually teaching them a skill that will help them in other aspects, including writing, believe it or not. They can look at the fractions from that, but also from the shapes, they can build lots and lots and lots of other shapes, from buildings to birds to fish, horses. By using the different shapes, they can make different objects, different uh, shapes, other shapes of things that are familiar to them. It's really good fun. So we also use fractions in every day. So like we were cooking and we had the soda, we can also use fractions as we're eating, as we're eating our piece of cake or we're eating our sandwich. What fraction of that piece of cake or that sandwich is your bite? What fraction of the soda did you drink? What fraction's left? What fraction of the fruit when you cut it up for dessert? What fraction did you use? What fraction's left? How many different fractions did you use as you ate it? It was your first bite a quarter, your second bite another quarter. So you've eaten half the orange. So this could go on for a whole day or even days. You could even keep a, a, a diary for four or five days looking at the different fractions that you actually used around your home during that day. What fraction of the toothpaste did you use when you brushed your teeth? What fraction of the ice cream did you eat? Get your children to describe things orally, to record things in written text, to record numbers, to make posters, to take pictures, to record their fractions throughout a day as a sort of living diary of everyday fractions. And the objective of that would just be to notice and describe different fractions in everyday life. Okay, so if you're using paper plates, I'll show you again, just to prove that I've done it. This again is another fun activity. So you're just using an ordinary paper plate. Even I happen to have some hanging around. So ask, ask your children, give them a plate and ask them to fold one in half and they should write half on each half. This is a good way to um, encourage literacy aspect of math. So the writing the words, when they get to the 16th, they might get a little bit fed up of writing 16th, but by the time they get to the end, they'll be able to write 16th without even thinking about it. You can then cut these up. So you'll get your scissors and cut the different fractions of the play up. And then the idea is that you ask them to make up a whole using the different fractions that they've cut out. So it could be one half, a quarter, and two eighths. And that would make a whole. And that's the idea of it, because all you need is paper plates, some scissors, a pen, and, and that's the equipment for that activity that could go on for 20 to 30 minutes and differentiated according to the age group that you're working with. And for this, close to half so you've got different pieces of paper 10 pieces of paper you number them one to ten i've just used some post-it notes here and then all you're asking to, them to do is combine the different numbers until you you pick a pick a card up you pick another card up and is it is it close is it close to the to the number that you've given to them so it's really easy and you can use this for lots of different activities and different games that again are in the max science resources, max maths resources, not science. And this is all based on the CPA. It's the concrete pictorial abstract. It's basically what we're saying is teaching maths through play, through fun, hands-on engagement. So lots of drawing, lots of cutting, lots of hands-on experiences to uh, promote maths with young children. And hopefully we'll be looking at some literacy or English skills next. And I'm sorry that we've running out of time really, but I was enjoying that far too much. So 
this is the three steps that we can look at for reading. I really like these three steps and I think they're useful for all learners. Even people that are researching at a higher level can use the three steps. So we, we, we focus on before you start to read, while you're actually reading and after reading. So we pick up a book and the before the reading, we've got a nice spinner there. You can spin round and that's the task that we should, should be looking at. So describe the front cover. What does it tell us? What does it tell us about the content of the book? Does it make us want to read it? Have you experienced something like it? Tell us about it. Talk about it. What do you think is going to happen in this book? What's the ending like? What's the story like? Describe the front cover. Does it look like it's interesting? Does the title tell us anything about the book? Does it give us any clues? What kind of topic are we talking about? What's the character, the theme of the book? Explain what you think will happen in the book. Have you experienced something like this before? Have you read a book like this before? Do you think the story is true? What is it about the cover of the book that makes you think that it could be a true, true story? Talk about what the author was thinking when he wrote the book. Why, why did he tell this story? Why did he want to write this story? How did she Think about this content. Has something happened? Why did she write this? Uh, what are the characters like? Who might it be about? Is it fiction? Talk about fiction, non-fiction. Obviously, in day-to-day -day teaching, I'm well aware that you won't have time to ask all these questions. Pick on a question. Use a key question. Use a key group. Group the children together and ask them a question. So you might have children of different age groups, you might decide to focus on a different question for each age group and then ask them to talk about it, to discuss it. And then the rest of the children in the group will also be challenged by something that's a little bit more challenging that other children have done or just their interpretation of it. If you ask different people different things and then they share it, overall you've covered more questions. So step two is during reading, while reading. Again, another spinner, print this onto card or draw it on card, put a, um, a stick through the centre and spin it, have it as a proper spinner. Ask the children to spin it, what question it lands on, that might be the one that you discuss or the one that you try to answer. So what do you think is going to happen next in this book? Stop, pause, what's this story telling us? What's happening next? What's the character doing? What do you think they'll do next? Is there a problem or a conflict? How will we deal with it? Where's the story set? Is it in the countryside? Is it night time? Is it daytime? Is it sunny? What's the weather like? What's the setting? Is it today? Is it in the past? What genre is the book? It could be horror, history, mystery. It could be a fantasy. The important thing is that you don't just ask the question. You listen to the response. Discuss it talk about it ask children to justify why why do you think that is what makes you think that what makes you believe that the discussion is probably the important part finally ask students or children to explain the book in 10 words this can be really really challenging they might need to write it down think about it choose more appropriate language change the way that they've written it but set it as a challenge. Can you explain this book in 10 words? That might be a challenge for afterwards or something to be done when they've actually finished the reading experience. The final step is after reading. And again, you've got another great Skinner, Spinner, which makes it a game, which makes it fun. And it's not just sat reading. It's a bit more engaging for some, some learners. Ask questions. Were you right? Did what you think would happen, did it happen? What changed? Was it a surprise? How did the main character work in the book? Did, did you expect that character to behave in the way that they did? Did they surprise you? If not, what, why? How did they manage to survive you? So it surprise you? Did they solve the problem or the conflict that you identified? How did they solve it? You might have lots of activities from reading episodes. You might ask them to change the ending of the book. Write the end. Write a new ending. 
it might be more challenging, different, completely different. It might be a happier ending or a sadder ending or a more gruesome ending. But it's all encouraging children to be creative and to use language effectively. Ask them to draw a new front cover. The front cover could be based on their new ending or it could be based on their interpretation of the book as they've read it and they've understood it and discussed it and answered the questions. Ask them to retell the story. They could act out, role play, act out different scenes, act out the whole book, act out part of the book for the family or an audience. Or they could create a comic strip, drawing squares on a piece of paper, drawing pictures into those squares. They might cut squares out of a magazine. This again is great uh, motor neuron skills for younger children, cutting pictures out and sticking them onto a storyboard. Again, you've got great differentiation from rewriting the end of the book to cutting pictures out and making a storyboard of the new ending. So that's step three. So that's that's everything I've got to share with you this morning. I could go on for hours and hours and hours, but I hope that you've got something useful from it. And teachers, please encourage carers and parents at home to relax and enjoy the children for a really, really special time in such a difficult time. So thank you very much. If you've got any Thank you so much to Debbie for a really engaging and hands-on webinar, particularly the um the science activities. I might try some of those with my nephew and nieces. They're currently at home as well. So um, I really, really appreciate all the help that Debbie's provided over the three subjects. If you would like to download any of the worksheets or refer to these, please do look at our home learning content page on our website to access all of the content. And also the webinar recording will be available on, on our YouTube page and past recordings of our home learning content is also available on our YouTube um, webinar page as well. Um, if you do, and if you're not already, please do follow. So for now, thank you so much to Debbie for a great session and thank you for the attendees as well for joining. We do have upcoming webinars and those will also be um, sent to you those dates via email as well. So thank you again and hopefully see you in our next webinar. Thanks Take care. Much. Take care everyone, thank you. Bye. Bye.